God's word this morning comes to us from Acts chapter 4, verse 32, uh, to chapter 5, verse 11. But we'll read only uh, from verses 32 to 35 together. The scripture reading is available in front of you, so if you're there, I invite us to rise in body or in spirit so that we can honor God's holy and sacred word together. I invite us to read this together in one voice. Ready, begin. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go to God in prayer as we ask the Lord to illuminate our hearts. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. In the midst of the multitude of words in our daily lives, speak your eternal word to us so that we may respond to your gracious promises with faithfulness, service, and love. For this we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. Now last week, uh, we learned about the camaraderie between Peter and John. They were together in ministry. They were together in their journey. They were together in their ups and downs. I mean, these two were the dynamic duo. Now, if you have your Bibles open with me, and if we look at the beginning of chapter 4, uh, these, these two, this dynamic duo, they were arrested together as well. Peter and John, not only were they arrested, they were put on trial together because of that healing that happened that we learned about the other week. The healing of that crippled man in front of the temple. But even through that trial, Peter and John held on to faith. They didn't just hold on to, bear, on, on to it barely. They held on to that faith with boldness. And when you have that kind of bold faith, the unthinkable happens. Look at verse 21 with me. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. Church, can you wrap your mind around that fact that a faith community was praising God for two of their main guys arrested? They were, they were praising God for two of their main guys being put on trial. This clearly means one thing. They were all in on the mission. Peter and John's captivity trial and now release had spread like wildfire. People were hearing the breaking news. This was clear that the faith community was praying for these two. This was clear that their release was an answer to their prayers. Now I want to pivot a little bit and treat the following like a little subtopic to this bigger message that we're talking about this morning. Kind of like a station identification. The kind of prayer that the faith community was praying throughout Peter and John's trial and captivity showed that they were all in. If you think about the 21st century Christian, ourselves included, there are way too many times where we pray prayers that are circumstantial or situational. We pray where we have a foot in the world of doubt and then a foot in the world of faith. We pray, you know, um, like for example, this morning I was talking with the Baptist pastor down the street and we were talking about, are we going to be able to get church in or not? Are we, you know, what's going on? And then I teased him. I said, why do you have a foot in doubt and a foot in faith when you know you're still going to be preaching God's word no matter what this morning? He said, Amen. <laughs> but that's the kind of prayers that our world is fallen into. But the kind of prayers that the faith community were praying 
here in this early church were prayers born out of desperation and urgency. They were praying to defeat the enemy. They were praying for victory, but more importantly, they were praying together in unity. They were united in prayer. Look at verse 24 with me. They said they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Another version said it this way. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Hallelujah. Wow. If more people were witnessing for Christ, if more people were not afraid to share about Christ, then maybe the faith community of today can also pray those kind of prayers of boldness and faith. You see, praying prayers of trust, knowing that God will empower the people to make the best use of whatever circumstance we all may be in to accomplish what he has willed. Now, going back into our passage we read this morning, we started off in verse 32, where we see the evidence of this unity in the church and how they sacrificed and shared for one another. There was none of this, um, if you borrow this from me, you gotta have, you're going to return that by tomorrow, right? Or there was, there was none of that kind of like, that's my stuff, so even if I let you borrow it, you got to give it back to me. There's more of a spirit of just take it, keep it, have it. Nothing was a waste. One thing we can learn here is that when the Holy Spirit is at work, giving is a blessing and not a burden. Now, many of you know that I am the chair of the executive committee of our classes, of our regional district of churches in our denomination, and I get the opportunity to, to hear stories of how each individual church is doing. But one thing that stuck out for me was that when there is a spirit of unity in that specific church, blessings increase. There is this new pastor that told me once, James, it's not like we have a hundred new people in our church, but out of nowhere, our offering increased like we had a hundred more people. I don't know what's going on. I said, well, maybe, just maybe, the Spirit of God is bringing together your people, God's people, in one accord, and the willingness to give is not a burden but a blessing. When the Spirit of God brought the faith community in the early church to one heart and soul, they were distributing and sharing like it wasn't theirs. Pride was not getting in the way. They were all in. Luke, who many say is the author of Acts, now touched on this guy named Barnabas who embodied and lived out that call. Now let me pause there. Church, imagine with me. You have a friend or an acquaintance that you know is just so good at what they do, right? They're always getting that golden star at work. They're always getting that promotion when you thought you deserved that promotion. You, they're always getting that community service award and you just think it's not fair. It's not fair that you can't even be angry or upset because they're just that good, they're just that kind, and they're just that nice. And in that moment, you can't deny that there's some jealousy. Can I get a witness? We've, 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 we've probably seen that or been there. But if you fast forward to the beginning of chapter 5, we have this guy named Ananias and his wife Sapphira, who are probably the complete opposite of Burn, uh, of Barnabas they were just filled with envy maybe some rage but yeah a lot of jealousy you might even be chuckling as you process this because it almost feels like this letter if you look at this letter it feels like it's written to today's church in 2023 who gets envious of someone being recognized for doing good who gets envious if they're getting credit when you're like, no, I'm the one that donated, right? Hey, why, are you, you, why aren't you recognizing me? I'm the one that donated it to the church. Hello? I want my golden plate on my pew. <laughs> Hello? I want my name on my pew. Pride can get to people. 
envy can get to people. Ananias and Sapphira wanted to get in on the action. They wanted to reap the benefits. They wanted their golden plaque on their pew. They wanted to take the credit, but they also wanted to take the easy way out. They were hoping to work the system in a, in a conniving way, get ahead of everyone else. So as they are getting ready to sell a piece of their property, they were scheming on how they would sort their funds. They are scheming and trying to figure out how much they would put up as a front and how much they would pocket. So after the closing, after the escrow was done, they got the money. They gave it to the apostles and claimed that they gave it all, that they should get that golden ticket and they, that they should be celebrated like the others. But in reality, they kept a portion of those sales and they pocketed it. They kept it for themselves. Look at verse 2 with me in chapter 5. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. The words right here, he kept back, means that he was doing this in a secretive way. He was doing this in a dishonest way. So Peter confronts Ananias. He was not afraid to confront Ananias. Verse 3, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and you have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? He's calling him out. Peter is equating the scheming because he caught on He's equating the scheming to this lying. He's equating this lying to the sinning. But more importantly, he's equating the sinning to Ananias' heart being filled with the devil. Be, to be filled with Satan. At the end of the day, Peter is bluntly saying that, Ananias, you are lying to God. You are not just lying to yourself. You're, just not, you're not lying to the apostles. You're also lying to God. This is not a slap on the apostles' faces. This is not a slap to people's faces. This is a slap, ultimately, to God's face. We talked about this the other week, about how sin is not only powerful, but dangerous. The devil will be at work not only from the outside in, but also the inside out. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, Sin has many tools, but a lie is the handle which fits them all. Whew. That's, that, that, that quote is, that, that, that will get you. Yeah. A lie is the handle which fits them all. Wow. Sin, lies, pride were not just a product of the devil, but it was a direct action against the faith community, against God's church. So what happens? Verse 5, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Now, Bible critics might argue and say, was lying really a sin that was, that, that, that it was strong enough that the judgment called for death? But in reality, 1 John 5 teaches us that there, is, there are sins that lead to death. See, if you look carefully, this was not a matter of whether Ananias and Sapphira didn't have salvation or not. This was not a matter of whether they knew the Lord or not, because the Spirit of God was clearly there. That is why the devil was trying to go to work. Because if the Spirit of God isn't there, why would the devil even bother to work? See, this lie, this pride, this sin wasn't just the simple trying to get away from things, but rather this was a huge sin directed against God's church. Think of it this way. If Peter had not been discerning, Ananias and Sapphira would have, been, would have become influential people in the church where the devil would have been able to work through them to accomplish his purposes. Look at what Peter said to Sapphira in verse 9. Hey, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. Ananias and Sapphira were dead before they even realized that the sins that they had committed were not about robbing God's church of money, but it was about robbing God of his glory. Church, we may be tempted to point fingers at Ananias and Sapphira 
and say, you can't be like Ananias and Sapphira. But in actuality, we need to do a self-reflection and see if we are walking the walk and talking the talk. Are we all in or are we having a foot in the world of doubt and the world of faith? Matthew 15, verse 8, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This morning I was reminded as, uh, of what happened when Hurricane Irene hit many years ago. I believe it was a year before Sandy in 2011. And I was living in, in Michigan at that time. And when I was hearing the news, because it fell on a Sunday morning, I don't know if you recall. And my father, who was ministering in Queens at that time, um, he didn't cancel church. So I was texting him. Why aren't you canceling church? He said, we have people just down the street who want to worship. They're going to walk. They're not going to drive, and they're not going to be having issues. For those three people, I need to get there to worship and to, to lead God's people in worship. I said, well, that means... Your staff have to get there. Don't you think of that too? And he said, well, this is an opportunity for me to be reminded where my heart is and where my lips are. If I'm telling people from the pulpit, you got to worship God, and I don't prioritize that, then that's something. Now, I'm not trying to guilt trip you if, you if you couldn't make it to church this morning. But what I'm trying to say is this. Where is our heart? Where is our words? Where is our actions? Are we all in or not? The lust for recognition, the lust for pride, the lust for being right will always be at the battle with the Spirit of God. When you feel like you're being attacked, you need to be reminded that the Spirit of God is there. That is why you're being attacked. You're not going to be tempted. You're not going to be attacked if the Spirit of God is not there. You see, when you're all in, we will be able to move from a fear of falling to that temptation to an awe and reverence of our Almighty God. Our Lord does not like sin, but that doesn't mean he's a mean God. Our Lord wants to get rid of sin, but that doesn't mean he's a wishy-washy kind of God. The last verse, verse 11, teaches us that a wave of godly fear swept over the church and over all who heard the story. That's exactly what we need to get back to in today's church. We need to get back into this awe and reverence of who our God is. We need to get back to this awe and reverence and, and, and this awe and wonder to say that, yeah, I'm all in because our God is a mighty God. I'm all in because our God is a God over the storms. Our God is a God who can do the impossible. We need to get back, church, to the basics of what this early church is teaching us this morning. We need to get back to the basis and learn from people like Peter and John and be all in. We need to stop having a foot in temptation in the world and in the faith. We can't put a foot in the world and a foot in faith any longer. My hope and prayer, church, is that as a faith community, we as a church family. May we also love our Lord fully. May we, love, may we love one another fully. May we love the call to be Christ's ambassadors together. May we all jump in together. Let us pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are the God above all. You are the God who is the God over the storms. Lord, we are reminded through the actions and words of Peter and John that we confess, Lord, that we have been too timid. We have had a foot in 
the world and a foot in church. And Lord, may this morning be a reminder to stop and learn how to jump and be all in. To learn how to have that bold faith. Because Lord, with you, it is well. With you, even in the crisis and ten, ten, tension and high intensity stress moments, Lord, we can say that it is well. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your covenant promise, for keeping us in your arms. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen.